Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And you can follow along in the Pew Bible in the New Testament on page 3. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was, far, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, do not put the Lord God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Maxie Dunham is a well-known Methodist preacher. And this story, he tells this story, and the story happened years ago when his children were all still in the house. And the whole household came down, except for him, with the flu. And uh, as I... Uh, Remember our own bout with the flu three weeks ago. Oh my Lord, that was awful. But his whole household came down with the flu except for him. And, and he was scheduled to go do this really significant preaching mission halfway across the country. And his wife, Jerry, was all worried. And she was worried and the kids were worried. They're worried about him being far away from home in this strange hotel room and all of a sudden get hit with the flu. But he's, you know, being the servant that he is, he made the trip. And so there he is in his hotel room, and he's unpacking his suitcase. And as he's unpacking his suitcase, he finds a note from his wife. And he opens it up, and she says, cheer up. You have two chances, one of getting the bug and one of not. And if you get the bug, cheer up. You've got two chances, one of living and one of dying. <laughs> and if you die, cheer up. You've got two chances. <laughs> we live in an age that resists either or thinking. We hear it over and over again that the truth is found somewhere in the middle. We hear it so much that we can begin to believe the temptation to believe that somehow truth is, it is relative to the individual's perception. The temptation to believe that the truth is whatever I define it to be. Scripture doesn't give us that option. You know, Scripture doesn't invite us to vote on which of the Ten Commandments that we like to have. It's not like we can come together and say, oh, preacher, I say, let's, have, let's keep Commandment 1, 4, and 5. Let's get rid of 6 through 10, and we'll table the discussion later on what we do with Commandments 2 and 3. 
that option isn't given to us. The tablets came down the mountain, and we just got to deal with them. The tablets came down the mountain, and we just got to deal with them. What strikes me about the gospel lesson today is that there is no middle ground. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's physically vulnerable. And anyone who is physically weak is also spiritually at risk. Remember that. Anyone who is physically weak is also spiritually at risk. And the devil says to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. It's a clever temptation, isn't it? It's a very clever temptation, for it appeals to one's survival instincts. If one hasn't eaten for a long time, then the body will just basically overpower the mind with messages that you have to take in some food, that you have to survive. Remember Esau when he came back from his hunting trip. Remember Esau was so hungry, so famished, that he sold his birthright to his brother for a bowl of stew. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus resisted the temptation. And notice what Jesus does. He marshals the scriptures as his weapon. He marshals the scriptures as his weapon against the devil. Still in a weakened condition, Jesus faced another temptation. The devil took him from the wilderness to Jerusalem, high up on the temple mount, at the pinnacle of the temple, and said, if you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down and let's see if God's angels will come and save you. If you are the Son of God, show me your stuff. If you are the Son of God, show me your power. You know, this isn't the only time that Jesus would hear that temptation, is it? Remember when he's on the cross and he's suspended between heaven and earth. You remember the priests are all there and the other crowd gathering around watching life ebb out of him, watching him die. And they're all there watching this and they're saying, if, if you are the Son of God, come down off that cross and then we'll believe you. Come down off that cross and then will believe you. Others in the crowd said, you know, he saved others. Let him save himself. Let him save himself. The second temptation is a temptation of exercising spiritual power to serve one's own ego needs. Jesus refused the devil, again, marshalling scripture as his defense and has his offense. The tempter comes again, as the tempter will come in all of our lives. The tempter doesn't just come once. The tempter doesn't just come twice. The tempter comes again and again. And the tempter came again to Jesus, and he takes them up to a high mountain, and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, if you bow down, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. I will give you all the power and all the kingdoms of the world. All you've got to do is bow down and worship me. Again, Jesus had the scriptures, and he used them, and he rebuked Satan with them. It's important to remember that these temptations are unique to Jesus. You know, I, in the season of Lent, one of the things in the season of Lent, you know, as a one grew up Catholic, I always have to give up something, right? It's just ingrained in me from elementary school. I can't not do it. And, and so in this season of Lent, one of the things that I'm giving up is desserts, right? Because, you know, I am a sugar, would you call that a sugar alcohol, a sugaraholic? Yes, I'm a sugaraholic. And I am just crazy for sugar. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy who eats circus peanuts. I'm the kind of guy who eats candy corn. I eat all that stuff. I just love sugar. So I'm giving up all desserts for Lent. And, and you know, I may be tempted 
to do wild and crazy things for a Snickers bar, right? You know, especially in this season where I'm running on low sugar, I may be tempted to do wild and crazy things for a Snickers bar, but I can't say to that stone, turn into bread. I can't, I'm not going to be taken up on top of a mountain and shown all the kingdoms of the world. I'm not going to be doing, that's not going to happen. I'm a Methodist preacher. I mean, you know, it's not like I'm going to have those kind of temptations. The temptations to Jesus were unique to who Jesus is. But also listen to me. The temptations to you are unique to who you are. The temptations that you will experience will be tailor-made to who you are. Your weaknesses, your drawbacks, all of those things. The temptations will come at you at your weak places. And so it's important this morning to glean from this scripture passage three things that we can take away. Three things that we can take away in this season of Lent to prepare ourselves. And so what I want you to notice from what Jesus did is I want you to notice spiritual obedience, the very first thing. Jesus obeyed the Spirit, and he went into the wilderness. How many times has the Spirit spoken to you or to me, and we just tune the Spirit out? Pay attention here. Jesus obeyed the Spirit and went into the wilderness. And the wilderness is not a place of a wasteland, but the wilderness is a point of spiritual preparation. Point number two, the wilderness is a place of spiritual preparation where he prepared himself for warfare. In the wilderness, he exercised the spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, and solitude. It is important to notice just how prepared Jesus was. When was the last time you took time away for solitude? When was the last time you took time just to get away from everything? You turned off your cell phone for a week, and you just had time alone with God. A good friend of mine, Doug Eason, he's passed away, but he used to be president of Mitchell Community College in Statesville. And every single year, he would take a week, and he would go to the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky, where Thomas Merton was a monk. And he would go to the Abbey of Gethsemane, and he would spend that entire week in prayer and scripture reading. He would not have his phone. Total isolation. How prepared are you? When was the last time you took time away to truly Prepare yourself for the temptations that you'll face in life. Point number three is notice just how prepared he was for every temptation. He had a scriptural response to counter the devil's enticements. You know, it's so important that we go to Sunday school. It's so important that we do disciple Bible study. It's so important that we have our youth at youth group that we have our children in children's ministry. It's so important that they're learning the stories of Jesus and we're learning the stories of Jesus. It's so important that we have our own scripture time every day of studying the scriptures and devotion and prayer. How prepared are you for the temptations that not might come your way, but the temptations that will definitely come your way. How prepared are you? The late Bill Henson told a story about a friend of his, and his friend it was a physician, and an important part of his friend's medical practice was his wife. And the friend's wife went, the doctor's wife, went to the hospital and visited all of his patients. And she would go and visit the patients and find out how's the care going and how's everything going for you. And, and she would do this routinely. And so and she's in the hospital and she's already visited some people. And she comes to a room and she enters into this room and there's a little girl there all by herself. 
She comes from a very large family, this little girl. A very large family with lots of siblings, and they're desperately poor. The mom has to be at home with the other children. The dad is out in the fields as a day laborer, making the money that he can make to take care of his family. And so she comes into this room with this precious little girl, and she notices that the little girl has eaten every bite on her breakfast tray, eaten every single bite. But there's this big old tall glass of milk, and it's sitting there, and she hasn't touched it. And, and she said, darling, don't you like milk? And she goes, oh, yes, ma'am. I love milk. I absolutely love milk. Well, well, then why haven't you drunk it? And she said, because no one has come here to tell me how far down I can drink it. No one has come here to tell me how far down I can drink it. You know, her situation was born of economic poverty, of having to share everything, including a glass of milk. But yet I think sometimes, in some ways, we're kind of like that little girl. Our situation is born sometimes of spiritual poverty, where we just, not because we haven't been told, but because we just let everything else cloud out, that we just don't drink long of God's Spirit. We don't partake of the feast that God has prepared for us. We allow ourselves to be running ragged. We don't take the time for retreats to replenish. And we run ragged, and we're wearied, and we are running, running on, running on empty, as Jackson Brown sings. We're running on. We're wearied. We're tired. We're not taking the time to replenish ourselves. The season of Lent, we have a choice. This season of Lent, we have a choice. We can choose to grow deeper into God by prayer, by fasting, by scripture reading and study, and by solitude, or we can choose to continue to approach God in a non-methodical, haphazard way that too often characterizes our lives. The choice is ours to make. The choice is ours to make. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.